It's time to get it right with Margaret Hoover on Sirius XM Insight. Comrades, commissars, friends, welcome back to Get It Right with Margaret Hoover on Sirius XM Insight 121. Margaret, um, still no word from her, right? Okay. We have r literally no idea what happened to her. Um, and we're sending out a search party. There's going to be helicopters and all sorts of things. Um, but in her stead, you have me, Michael Moynihan, and uh, I am a columnist for, for The Daily Beast, and uh, I host a show for Vice News, which you should be watching called The Business of Life. Um, and today, this happy, lovely Friday, I always hoped that – I said to you yesterday, Melanie, our lovely producer, that maybe it would be a bit cheerier today because it was Friday. But nothing that is out in the ether um, in my universe is ever too cheery. Um, interesting. black right now. I am wearing black. As Morrissey once said, I wear black on the outside because black is how I feel on the inside. <laughs> I, you know, there's nothing too um, um, exciting and happy and lovely to talk about. But there's a lot of really interesting things to talk about that are a bit grim. Now, first, before we get to um, our first guest, um, I want to do my daily um, thing about Donald Trump. And I say daily thing because I don't want to get too specific and use pejorative uh, words. I'm not a particular fan, as listeners might already know. But there's one thing that it will not catch fire, and I tweeted it out, and nobody cares about this. But a video emerged, ladies and gentlemen, uh -oh. of the Donald in 1995 at a fundraiser for Sinn Féin IRA spokesman, leader, terrorist, ratbag Jerry Adams, who was granted a 24-hour visa by Bill Clinton in 1995 before the peace process to come to the United States um, and uh, shake his tin cup and uh, exploit all the people with surnames like mine, Moynihan, um, to give him money. And so Donald Trump was there, you know, tipping his cap in the front row um, on board with a ruthless um, repulsive uh, terrorist. Um, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, overstating the case. Jerry Adams was a member of the IRA's Army Council, as much as he denies it. He was. And he was involved in some pretty, pretty hideous stuff, including the uh, disappearance and murder of a woman named Jean McConville. He's been accused of this, I should say. Um, uh, very credibly accused by somebody else in the IRA um, who's disappeared and um, uh, left. Uh, she was just a, a widow. And then there was nine children, I think nine or ten children left without, uh, without parents because uh, Jerry Adams in the IRA thought she was uh, ratting people out to the British. Now, this won't stick to Donald Trump because nothing seems to. But Donald Trump also, one more thing to point out before we move on, is that the IRA and Sinn Féin, the political wing of the IRA, is essentially, was is still essentially a Marxist political entity. Their, their economic policy is Marxist. They're very sort of um, active in the pro-Palestinian movement, which is not necessarily a Marxist thing, but at the time it was. And, you know, this is a guy who's claiming these days to be a conservative. Um, he's taken some very liberal positions in the past. One of those was to give his uh, support, uh, full-throated support, uh, to Jerry Adams, the leader of Sinn Féin and former Army Council member of the IRA. So that is my little rant. Second rant leads into our first guest. You know, if you can follow that, please do. Second rant leads into our first guest. Now, there's some tension along the border between North and South Korea. Nothing new about this. It, it's become a bit hot recently with uh, exchange of fire. So this morning I uh, woke up and I read a piece on uh, The Atlantic. Which is, you know, it's a mixed bag. You get a lot of good stuff. And our, actually, our next guest, um, or our first guest, uh, has written for them um, a few times. And the headline was this, how loudspeakers and balloons heighten tension along the Korean border. Now, this fire, this uh, exchange of gunfire on Thursday, the implication of this article is that these loudspeakers that broadcast propaganda from the South Korea into the North, the North Koreans do the same thing, and balloons. Now, what are balloons? Well, 
I made a documentary about this, so you should all watch this online. It's on uh, YouTube. I did it for Vice called Balloons Over Pyongyang. And I did that with the assistance of our, our first guest. And these balloons are launched from the border of South Korea to North Korea because there's an information embargo, which is a nice euphemism for saying a total blackout and an Orwellian system of propaganda in, in the North. And so a lot of these people who are defectors and activists and human rights activists uh, launch balloons. They study wind patterns and they load these balloons with propaganda, with money, uh, American dollars, candy, um, and in one load, DVDs of the movie The Interview. <laughs> the Seth Rogen... That's the uh, best thing I've heard all week. It is the best thing you've heard all week. <laughs> now, there are some people out there that say, good God, you are exacerbating tensions. And this is this incredible moral relativism that says that people who are trying to get information to the captive people of North Korea are somehow guilty of creating or exacerbating tensions between the North and South. Now, our first guest I'd like to introduce now is a is a, a friend of mine. I have to I have to acknowledge that that he is a friend. Uh, he's a he's a human rights advocate and a film producer too, and he's done a bunch of good films. Um, and he's the founder of the Human Rights Foundation (HRF) and their offshoot, uh, the Oslo Freedom Forum, which they had every, every year, which is the Lollapalooza of human rights. Um, and you hear meet so many fascinating people, and I've I've been there, and I've um, moderated some panels there with people like uh, Pussy Riot, uh, Gary. Cam Kasparov, the great chess champion and great human rights activist, is always there, um, and as I, I believe is, a, is on the board. Um, and Thor Halverson is the guy behind this, and he has a very, very special connection, his own personal connection to human rights problems um, in his country of birth, which is Venezuela. And uh, Thor has been on the front lines, and shall we say on the border between North and South uh, Korea, helping get getting this information there, in waging this information war. Thor Halverson, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to be on your show, man. It's great. And, uh, you know, Margaret Hoover, you know, I know lots of people, people from Chechnya. Chechnya. If you need Margaret Hoover to disappear for longer, I can help you with that. <laughs> they have few skills in Chechnya. Um, one of those skills, though you are right, is disappearing people. And unfortunately, I don't know how. The first question I'm going to ask you before we get to North Korea, it you know the one thing I think about you when I when I think about the work that you do, and there was a fantastic profile by the way, it was a, it, it, you know. 8,000 word profile by a terrific writer named Matt Labash who profiled Thor in the Weekly Standard um, and just gives a great glimpse into Thor's life and his, his thought processes. Uh, you know, what is it like every day, Thor, when you, when you were dealing with such tragedy and disaster? I mean, doesn't it kind of break hope? I mean, I know a guy that a Cuban activist who was, uh, um, who I think passed away recently, wrote a book called Against All Hope, which which I think you turned me on to. Do you lose hope after a while of seeing this constant flood of horrors and illiberalism across the world? Well, of course not. You're assuming that a state of liberty and a state of prosperity and peace is actually the, the, uh, the no normality. When in fact, horror and pain and suffering and poverty and hunger, that has been the state of mankind from, from, it's, it's from the beginning. And in fact, the word poverty didn't exist. It used to be called the human condition. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's about expectations, you know? You, you, don't, you don't choose what ends up happening to you in your life. Circumstances sometimes happen. You may lose a parent. People, injustice may happen. But you do have a choice in how you respond to those conditions in life. So some of us in life choose to smile and some people choose to just let life put, you know, put a paw on their head and, and, and hold them down. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the answer. I mean, how many, you've met North Korean defectors who I smile, have. who laugh. I have. I mean, I, they are in some ways some of the more spirited people that I've met, and and you know I've seen them on a trip with uh, that that you helped uh, arrange. Uh, I've seen them break down in tears, uh, telling the stories of their families. But um, the joy, um, it, it was something that seemed incongruous at first. But you're right. I mean, it, it, it is something that was noticeable, and um, you know something that was in, uh, inspirational in a lot of ways. And and to this point, to this this Atlantic magazine piece, just the headline: How loudspeakers and balloons heighten. Along uh, the 
Korean border. You've been involved in a lot of these balloon launches, and you're a big advocate of them. How do you respond to the criticism? And in the film that I did, we tried to do a, a balanced film in this, and we included a lot of people um, that were critical of these. How do you respond to that? You say that this is actually heightening the t tensions and making things worse. Okay, well, uh, first off, the piece in, in The Atlantic uh, by Matt Chavenza is an embarrassment. It reveals how little he actually knows, but, but more problematic is he reveals how little he actually cares. The fact is that, no, people standing on one side of the border and sending information into the other side of the country are not actually bringing the place closer to war. No more than, than someone who stood against Nazi Germany or wrote columns criticizing Hitler in American newspapers is, quote, unquote, provoking anyone. So it, it really is it's appalling to have that position. And it, it's sort of a heckler's veto. That's, that's like saying that, you know, if, Michael, you went to give a speech somewhere and people were picketing your speech, you are thus responsible for the people picketing or for the people rioting. It's yeah. an absurd, absurd position. Yeah, and it's a position we hear um, frequently these days, and we heard it quite a bit when it came to um, Charlie Hebdo, when it came to uh, Fleming Rose, who, uh, incidentally, I, I interviewed on stage at the Oslo Freedom Forum run by Thor Halverson and the Human Rights Foundation. Um, it is often said, well, you know, you are just, you know, uh, antagonizing these people. And if only we were kind to them, people like Kim Jong-un, who, you know, obviously is otherwise a very reasonable man, <laughs> would uh, just kind of, uh, you know, go away or institute liberal reforms without, without these balloons coming in and making them angry? Well, it, it's interesting because it's just, let's actually discuss what it is, is being smuggled in. Mm -hmm. it's, not like, it's not like what's being smuggled in is, is, you know, it's something calling for war. It's not like what's being sent on the loudspeakers is something saying, you must, you know, kill your leader or anything like that. We're simply getting messages across to tell these awfully impoverished people that there is a world out there that they are not familiar with where there is freedom. Mm. The, the, the North Korean government, this is what most people fail to get. The North Korean government raises their people from birth um, to believe that it's kind of like the Hunger Games. They're raised to believe that everywhere outside of North Korea is starving and is absolutely horrendous. And if you actually go to South Korea, that they will kill you. Hmm. They have brainwashed their people into believing that, there's, that the world out there is a terrible place and that our dear leader, Kim Jong-un, needs your allegiance to protect us. Yeah. Because if he, if he does not have your, your allegiance, the world will end as far as you know it, which is why they have to have this militarism, which is why they have to have this dictatorship. So it's a massive swindle. They've yeah. swindled tens of millions of people. And what we're trying to do is break that monopoly and tell them you're being lied to. That's why the government considers it provocative, yeah. because the government is lying to their own people. Anyone who misses that part is someone who should not be opining on the subject. And the people at the Atlantic should be embarrassed for having run that article. The, the, there is, um, as you say, the propaganda that comes in, and this is the term, uh, by the way, the people that are that are sending this stuff in use, and it's, uh, I think it's a sort of value-neutral ne term in its real sense, propaganda. It's getting information, and none of it is, is agitating for war. It's very different than, we say, sort of something like 1956, when Radio Free Europe was broadcasting its Hungarian service into Budapest during the uprising. You made a film about this, by the way, the 1956 uprising in Budapest. And they said, you know, help us on the way, and the Eisenhower administration didn't help, that was bad because there were people in the streets uh, expecting um, NATO powers to come in and, and save them. This is, is rather different. And one thing I wanted to point out to, to listeners, in the stuff that goes across, one thing a, a North Korean defector uh, told me when, when I was in Seoul uh, in, I guess that was January, um, what I found totally fascinating, he said, we took a video camera. And we went through a South Korean grocery store and we just filmed. We filmed produce, we filmed stock shelves, and we put that video on flash drives to get that into to North Korea. Just to give them a sense, as, as Thor Halverson, um, our guest, just said, that South Korea is not a, a place that is starving. It is a place uh, of, of plenty, especially compared to uh, the North. Um, so what is, what is it now? I mean, you got a lot of uh, 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 stick from people about trying to get the movie The Interview 
into uh, North Korea. Um, that, that was a really passionate response, um, much more so than the article that I saw today in The Atlantic. How did you respond to that? Said that this is so provocative and Kim Jong-un is killed in this Hollywood movie and this is, is, is the wrong way of going about things. Well, well, first off, first off, Michael, the, the North Korean government is constantly making short films. This is the government, not the people, not some private filmmaker, no such thing exists. But the government is constantly making films showing uh, New York under a mushroom cloud, showing the murder of the American president, and so on and so forth. This is a parody. This is like a joke movie. It's a Seth Rogen movie. It's for stoners. Mm. And it's a movie that is very powerful in North Korea for one reason and one reason only. It's got nothing to do with the ending of the movie. It's the premise of the movie. The movie is called The Interview, and it's about James Franco scoring an interview for his sort of like schmaltzy E-type television interview uh, show. And what is groundbreaking is the very idea that Kim Jong-un would sit for an interview. Why is that so radical and revolutionary? Because Kim Jong-un is not a man. The North Korean people are raised to believe that he is a descendant of God. He is literally part of the Holy Trinity. With Kim Il-sung, his grandfather, the, man, the Soviet agent that essentially created North Korea and kept those people locked in, um, he is the sort of God the Father. Um, and, and, you know, Kim Jong-il is sort of like the Holy Spirit, and Kim Jong-un is Jesus. And the, the North Koreans are brought up to that. So the idea that there would be a movie where Kim Jong-un is interviewed is, is absolutely insane. Yeah. The premise itself, and North Koreans we've talked to and have told us, this movie does more to chip away at the belief that the government is all-powerful and all-knowing and all-seeing than anything else. Because if he is God, why would God permit such a thing? Yeah. So most people come to these discussions with such, such woeful ignorance, and it's, it's really sad. And if they just scratch the surface, they'd find that the North Korea situation is unbelievable. It's also fascinating. Mm. But what we're seeing now with these, with these you know, saber-rattling is frankly just part of the same old soap opera. Every other week, the North Korean government has to tell its people that they're about to be attacked, that it's the end of the world, which is why they need to bear, grin and bear the situation that they're in. It's yeah. just the same old, same old. So as a human rights activist, and, you know, this, this is your metier, this is what you do, and this is your job. And one of the things that I find fascinating about this is when you're doing uh, work in, in places like Cuba, uh, places that are where information is not accessible to the average citizen, but outsiders can come in and smuggle information in, can bring sort of internet connections, they can bring um, flash drives in. Give us a sense of how you guys get, or you guys help activists, because not necessarily you guys doing it, help activists get information into such a closed society like North Korea, where, you know, if you actually manage to get into the country, you have a minder on you all the time and you see the same Potemkin tour that everybody else does. How how are people getting information? I'll give one example to lead you in because I think our, our listeners will be fascinated by this. I met with, and you were you were there, a, a, um, a guy who was a hacker who ran the sort of hacker brigade uh, in North Korea uh, before he defected. And he showed us one of the methods of getting information in. In this, I thought was so fascinating. It was inventive. It was smart. In the in most important thing, it was primitive. And because it, it's a necessity that it be primitive, he, uh, you know, I, I believe with with uh, the assistance of the Human Rights Foundation, created basically what was a large slingshot. And they would pull this thing back and put in USB drives and shoot this stuff over the border. That, I thought, was absolutely fascinating. Tell us some of the ways that information gets in uh, into North Korea. Well, I mean, you know, when you, when you say the word hacker, a lot of your listeners immediately think of a computer hacker. In fact, a hacker can be, I mean, it's anyone who can, you know, get a shortcut. Someone who knows how to, yeah. you know, pick a lock, that's a hacker. Someone who, who can, you know, uh, um, just, just jump a few steps. Now, the way we hack North Korea is very low tech. It doesn't involve um, using, you know, cyber anything, a, a slingshot across the border at a very, very close point in the river that, you know, there's a river that separates the, the north and south, and there's a river that separates it from China. Um, uh, the river is a very useful place, and they can't patrol the entire border. 
So uh, using a slingshot to get something across is a, is a re- relatively safe way. But there are, you know, using balloons, putting things into bags that then go up into the air, that they're taken into the north, and then there's a small, you know, acid-based detonator that breaks the, the, the bag and then everything falls to the ground. But also there's smuggling. The North Korean people are starving for information. They want to pay for it. North Koreans want to watch what you watch on TV. So they want to watch soap operas, and they want to watch reality TV, and they want to watch all sorts of things that is not available over there. So they're willing to pay for it. So they're willing to pay, you know, a couple bucks for a, for a flash drive that has all sorts of information. So there are people who smuggle stuff across the border with China and pay off the border guards. Um, their border guards are very easy to bribe because, it, I mean, the country, again, is so, so corrupt and so many people need money that people bring over thousands of, of, of um, flash drives over the border. And when that happens, it makes its way into this black market of information. And people buy this stuff. Some, sometimes they get executed for having it. But people are willing to risk that because they want cultural products. And to point out, um, you know, the first thing that most people think when they hear this, and uh, I've had people ask me this too, is that, well, flash drives into North Korea. I mean, this is a, a country that was beset by famine in the 90s, people eating grass and bark to try to stay alive. What are they plugging these flash drives into? And the, the answer to that question is that they're uh, smuggling, what, cheap DVD drive, DVD players that have um, USB inputs? Is that right? Well, think about it. North Korea's neighbor um, is China. And China produces all sorts of things that they've ripped off over the years from, from Germany, from Japan, from the United States. So you can buy a, a small, you know, laptop type device for anywhere between 40 and $100. So believe it or not, despite what people may think, the level of computer penetration in North Korea is a lot higher than, than you'd imagine with, I'd say, most people having one degree or two degrees of separation to someone that has a DVD player, and maybe two or three degrees of separation to someone who has a computer. And as a result, you know, these things are passed around. Wikipedia is fascinating to them. There is no internet in North Korea at all. It's cut off. But we were able to get, thanks to Wikipedia and the Wikimedia Foundation in San Francisco, we're able to get um, Wikipedia onto a thumb drive, all of it in Korean, where it's like self-contained. And that to them is fascinating because they learn about these, these world history that they have no idea about. These people are, are, are living in an alternate universe, an alternate reality. And they're being held hostage by one crooked family that just so that they can have scotch and hookers have kept these people in absolute abject poverty and in a brainwashed state of paranoia about war. I think this is uh, fascinating and, and a big uh, thank you and round of applause to the to the Wikimedia Foundation uh, for allowing this. And when I heard about this, a massive sort of online, offline uh, trove of uh, wiki material that people can just plug into their computer and, and view. And, and people don't often understand just how revolutionary that is uh, in North Korea. You're listening to Get It Right with Margaret Hoover. This is Michael Moynihan filling in for Margaret Hoover. And our guest is Thor Halverson, uh, the uh, head of the Human Rights Foundation. Foundation, the founder and the founder of the Oslo Freedom Forum. Uh, Thor, let's move on uh, from North Korea and say, what else um, is is going? What other hot spots are you guys focusing on? And one thing I do want to talk about, because I think it's very important, and unfortunately, um, I think it's gone off a lot of uh, the radar screens of Americans, is something that is very, very personal to you. So let's start with Venezuela, a country that uh, you grew up in uh, and that your cousin who was uh, challenging the Chavez regime and now the Maduro regime and was arrested for this and has been in prison for um, a couple of years now, I believe, right? A year and a half, two years. And uh, tell us the situation uh, in Venezuela and tell us the situation uh, with your cousin, Leopoldo Lopez. Sure. Well, Venezuela is is a, in most people, uh, Venezuela used to be a, a perfectly malfunctioning democracy with the crony people and government and so on and so forth. Along came a populist called Hugo Chavez, who rose to power promising to fight corruption. And instead, when he got into power, he basically started a massive anti-America campaign and basically signed up for every imaginable thing that had nothing to do with Venezuelan history, all so that he could remain in power and create an internal situation of conflict. Not that different from the North Korean situation where the government tells everyone that 
you know, there's a war imminent with the South, and it's just, you know, episode 230 of the same recycled soap opera. In the case of Venezuela, it was, you know, we went from being a country with perfectly normal relationships with the United States to believing the U.S. is the great Satan. And, of course, instituting all sorts of government control for everything. What happens, you know, as Margaret Thatcher so accurately observed, is the problem with socialism is eventually you have other people's money. Um, the Venezuelan government has run out of more than a trillion dollars received in oil. In a country of 20-something million, um, by either giving it away to other countries, to uh, crony dictators in other places, but, but rather problematically, there are shortages in Venezuela. The people are dying because they can't get the right medicines. People are dying in hospitals because they, there are people dying because there is no electricity. Um, uh, operating rooms, sometimes people have to operate under cell phone light. I am not joking. This is not an exaggeration. The thing is, you may not be reading it all over the place because it's just normal news there. More people have died as a result of a crime wave unleashed by the government by opening up the prisons than have died in the, the Palestinian conflict since 48. A quarter of a million people have died as a result of crime under Chavez. Yeah, to, for, so, our li- for our listeners to get a sense of this, um, I was in Caracas a few years ago doing a, doing a film, and uh, we stood out in front of uh, the morgue in um, Caracas. There's one morgue, and there needs to be one, more than one morgue for the number of murders there are in, in Venezuela. That year, the government stopped releasing figures because it was uh, reflecting poorly on them. There were 21, I believe, thousand murders in, in Venezuela. So to give that some sort of perspective, there are 29 million people in Venezuela. There are 20,000 murders. In the United States that year, there were 13,000 murders in a country of 320 million. This is the situation that has beset uh, Venezuela. And, you know, the morgue, there was, it was a fascinating thing. There were journalists from uh, one opposition newspaper, which has since been, been neutered. Uh, and I was with a journalist uh, named Davis, a fantastic guy. And he said, we come out here every day and we have somebody here every day because we count the bodies because there's one morgue in all of Caracas. So we count the bodies because the government won't give us figures, which I thought was absolutely astonishing. And then to come back after that and do an appearance on MSNBC, as I did, and be against on a panel of three people, uh, all of whom were defending Hugo Chavez, which I thought was absolutely miraculous. Well, most of those people that were defending Hugo Chavez are either defending him because, A, they got paid, or B, because they don't really care about the Venezuelan people. They're simply caring about the fact that Chavez does not like the United States. Yeah. So it becomes a circumstance of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And those people, I mean, there's a special place in hell reserved for people like that. Mm-hmm. Because they, they ultimately don't care one whit about the, the life of the ordinary individual. And really, at the end of the day, um, how you should judge a government is, and does it respect the rights of the ordinary individual? Not, not, not this elitist sense that, oh, it's okay to, you know, uh, break a few eggs because we're making an omelet. And that's the kind of thinking that so many of the defenders of, of Chavez or of the, even the regime in North Korea have. Um, but I mean, sadly, Venezuela is about to become a humanitarian crisis. Um, and you'll remember this conversation, Michael, because it's going to be a bloodbath. The government right now has no control over the, gun, uh, over the country itself. There are thousands of armed gangs. In a country, by the way, that has, though deaths you mentioned, yet total gun control. Mm-hmm. The citizens are not allowed to have any guns. And what we have is a state of complete lawlessness. Um, so it, it's appalling. And my cousin, Leopoldo Lopez, is one of the leaders of the opposition, and he has been in prison because he's a threat to them. The, the, the many people in the opposition have sold themselves. It's sort of like a fake opposition. They, they, they take bribes from the government to sort of pretend to oppose them. But so you'll know who the real opposition is because they're either being persecuted, they're being exiled, or, or they're being put in prison. And, and your cousin who um, was running and has run for various offices, and he was a mayor too, right, in a, a municipality. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, right he's, he's a Harvard-trained economist. Yeah who um, was a very popular mayor. In fact, what made his mayoralty so remarkable was the fact that when murder rates were going up countrywide and crime was rampant countrywide, in the area of his mayoralty, crime saw a decline, which is a sort of total outlier. So that's why he became so popular, um, and that's why he became a threat to the government. So the government disqualified him from running for elections. And And so then when he started street protests, peaceful street protests, they arrested him for... A gazillion crimes is now down to two, but it started off of murder, terrorism, arson, you name it. Now it's down to like 
you know, arson and they have no fire. So it's going to be tough. And so in, in, in the odds uh, of him, I mean, they're, they're whittling away at these charges. But do you have any hope uh, that uh, this will resolve itself and, and your cousin will be free? I don't I, anytime soon, I hope, because um, we don't see people like Jimmy Carter that are usually intervening in places like Venezuela um, stumping on behalf of your cousin, unfortunately. Uh, no, unfortunately not. Jimmy Carter has been a hardcore defender of the regime in Venezuela for a very, very long time. In fact, I had a chance last August to confront President Carter about this um, in a room full of people. And um, he, I also informed him that it would be great if he actually did not ever come back to Venezuela to count the votes in an election. He never really counted them the first time around. Mm. Um, it, it was Mrs. Carter's birthday, and he left um, before even doing an audit and said, you have a great system here. Let me tell you, electronic voting systems, not a good idea. Yeah. I, I think everyone who believes in freedom should oppose them yeah. from this from the get go. Uh, Thor Halverson, uh, we're out of time, and I thank you uh, so much uh, for for uh, joining us. And I hope I will see you in uh, 2016, in May of 2016, in Oslo, as I have many times before. The you listeners should go to the Human Rights Foundation's website. And one thing I highly recommend is signing up for their email service, and you get uh, a blast every once in a while of. Uh, hotspots and the work that they are doing, which is fine work. Thank you, Thor. And we will be back after this break with another fantastic guest. You're listening to Get It Right with Margaret Hoover on Sirius XM Insight. Where current events meet culture. Get It Right with Margaret Hoover. Right. Welcome back to Get It Right with Margaret Hoover on Sirius XM Insight 121. I'm Michael Moynihan, filling in for uh, Margaret Hoover. Um, all right, well, thank Thor, who's a fantastic guest, a punchy guy, and uh, one of my uh, favorite people in the sort of human rights uh, industry. But moving on, let's sort of shift gears a little bit here. Um, you know, when I was, I grew up in Massachusetts. For all of you who don't know, I suspect everybody out there does know my biography. And if they don't, shame on you. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts, and I grew up in a leafy, lovely, bucolic little hamlet just to the west of Boston called Concord. Um, not a very conservative place at all. Uh, childhood friend was uh, the uh, uh, son of uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin and Richard Goodwin, uh, great liberal historians and, and lovely dear people. And so I was never exposed to conservatism in that milieu that was just completely an alien thing to me. I, uh, so I remember when I was, God knows, I mean, 11, 12, 13 years old, uh, and I, I remember turning on the television and uh, catching a uh, firing line with William F. Buckley. And there was a man twinkling in his eye, lockjawed, wonderful cadence. And I said, who is this mysterious person? So I started watching it. And I watched it fairly regularly, not not sort of, I didn't set the alarm to it, but it was on and it did inform my political education. It didn't make me into some sort of rock rib conservative or a Catholic or anything like that. Because um, in Massachusetts, we're all sort of Catholics in name only. Uh, Bill Buckley was very serious about it. Um, and so I went through that and I actually met Bill Buckley one time on 86th Street after his book on Nuremberg, his novel on Nuremberg came out. And I went to see him read from it because I was in the neighborhood. And I was too nervous to talk to him. So on 86th Street, I stopped him as he was hailing a yellow cab. And he engaged me in conversation for a good 10 minutes. And we talked about Whitaker Chambers, who uh, the man who um, exposed Alger Hiss and was a friend of Buckley's and worked for National Review for a brief, brief period of time. And it was just a wonderful exchange. And I said, "This, I, I like this guy. I, want to, I don't agree with him on a lot, not on, a lot of, on, not on everything, but I had a great admiration for him. So a new film has come out, and I this sort of nerdery informed my excitement. I was in California shooting the last two episodes of my show for Vice. And I kept on looking on video on demand. I kept on looking on iTunes to see if this film was 
concurrently released as video on demand, and it wasn't. And I was so mad at uh, the direct the directors, two of them. I was especially mad at Robert Gordon because he's our guest today. So I'm going to just focus my anger on him. And I couldn't find it. But I came back, and because this movie is so spectacular, it is so good, um, that it's still running at the IFC Theater here in uh, New York, and it's running around the country, and it's called Best of Enemies. And the focus of this uh, documentary is the 1968 debates between Gore Vidal and William F. Buckley, very famous debates on ABC during the Democratic and Republican conventions of that year. And I have a million questions, and I wish we had seven hours, but Robert Gordon is probably at the tail end of his promo tour, and we're pulling him out of retirement to do this. So thank you, Robert Gordon, for joining us. Hey, I'm very happy to be here. Um, terrific film. I, you know, I really love this, and you know, it was beautifully constructed. Um, it was a wonderful arc to it. The the footage was fantastic. Mm -hmm. These brilliant start with uh, with Gore uh, Vidal and Ravello. Um, tell us a little bit about what drew you to this film. That these debates uh, really presaged a new era in in American political discourse and 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 media. Right. I mean, that's sort of the premise of the film. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. They're kind of a crossroads. They're. They're a uh, end of one era and beginning of a, of a, of another. Um, I was drawn because, in part, because in college I was always fascinated by the literary feuds. You know, I was seven in 1968. Um, uh, so when I was in college in the late 70s and early 80s, um, Dick Cavett's TV show wasn't too far gone. It wasn't uh, unheard of for Johnny Carson to have... Uh, a writer on, you know, as a guest. It was, we were still a much more literary society, and um, the literary feuds were always fascinating. Norman Mailer, you know, or Truman Capote, or Gore Vidal. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I knew about these debates back then, and they kind of fell off my radar over time. Um, I began writing books and making documentaries, and a friend of mine, I'm from Memphis, and a friend of mine in Memphis had been long fascinated by these debates and had, uh, after years, gotten a bootleg DVD of them, and and he and he showed me that the the debates, and I was just totally taken by everything that was going on between Gore Vidal and William Buckley, and perhaps most by the sense that what they were saying was so contemporary that that the argument between them fully anticipated the culture wars that we live in now. And I just thought how great a documentary it would make. And uh, one of my filmmaking partners is Morgan Neville in Los Angeles. He won, in between the last film we made together and this one, he won an Oscar for 20 Feet from Stardom. I was like, great, yeah. Morgan. You're putting a lot of pressure on us. <laughs> it's a ter also a terrific film, too. Yeah. Um, I, I have to say that I, I really have to meet your friends because, um, you know, when I was younger, we had, like, bootleg uh, replacements uh, albums yeah. and bootleg Bob Dylan basement tapes. You have bootleg uh, Buckley Vidal debates. Uh, so you, you come to this film, and uh, by the way, it's fascinating. You have an incredible cast of characters, and this is really the, one of the great parts of this film, is it's leaving with so many people um, whom, you know, my former friend passed away, Christopher Hitchens, who's fantastic in the film. And you have Reed Buckley, who is an arresting image on, on the screen because he sounds and looks exactly like William F. Buckley. Startling. And it was it's, really startling. Oh, my God, it's startling. And, and you know, of course, you, um, you got to, uh, I imagine, meet one of, I assume, probably one of your heroes because he, most people in media as a hero is Dick Cavett, mm -hmm. uh, who's, who's involved in this, too. Um, what kind of cooperation, by the way, did you have from both of the families, from the Buckley family and, and, and the Vidal estate, I should say? Well, um, you know, we there, there's like you've noted, there's no Vidal family. We actually, this was five years in the making. So when we began it in 2010, Gore Vidal was still alive. Yeah. Um, and I'll note, you, you, you mentioned Hitchens. We got to Hitchens in spring or early summer of 2010, it was about two weeks before he was diagnosed with cancer. So yeah. there was no Paul hanging over our yeah. conversation. It was very um, warm and lighthearted. And, and I, didn't, I didn't think Hitch would mind me saying this, uh, um, is that it, I could tell exactly when it was because it was chubby Hitch. <laughs> it was like healthy, sweaty, Rothman exactly. smoking, chubby Hitch. Bourbon Hitch's. drinking. <laughs> yeah. Bourbon drinking Hitch. Um, and, but I noticed that, that Christopher uh, Buckley isn't in the film. 
Well, um, so he's the one. He's sort of the one interview that we had hoped to get that we didn't get. And each and we approached him uh, at the very beginning of the film, about midway through, and then again at the end. Um, and each time he very politely demurred. Um, our sense of it was, and and we actually we, we sort of confirmed this with him afterwards that he this is sort of a this was a festering wound in the Buckley family, and he was honoring his father's. Uh, legacy by not um, by not uttering the V word. You know, Buckley was really renowned for his unflappability and his wide range of tastes in people and subject matter. He had many, many liberal friends, which is part of what makes him such an interesting conservative. Um, but the one guy who he truly hated you know the the he would get on firing line and he would he would attack these guests and then and then the they'd you know go to a break during the show and the guests would be kind of tongue hanging out going what and there'd be friendly banter again and then the light would come back on and bill would put the gloves back on <laughs> but not with Vidal. no yeah. these were not frenemies in any way yeah, and i think that 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 is clear in the film and i uh, bill buckley once once advised uh, a friend moving to new york that when you come to new york make sure to hang out with the liberals because the conservatives are boring exactly. and this is a guy that was at truman capote's black and white ball this is a guy who was very good friends with john Kent galbraith was friends with norman mailer a subject of a not not very good new book um but you know that is not the animosity the animosity is not um you know he is a lefty and i'm a righty and we can't get along that was never a problem right. uh, for buckley what was it? I mean, I don't suspect. I thought for a second, was it you know his Catholicism and 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 uh, Vidal's you know pornography, as as Buckley would yeah. say, and his Myra Breckenridge, Myra Breckenridge is hideous um, thing. But even at the same time, Pat Buckley moved in these circles where Oscar De La Renta was one of her best friends. All of her friends were gay, and Bill didn't seem to mind that. What was the animosity? Where did it come from? So I'll tell you that I entered the process in 2010 thinking that it was about that I knew Buckley was a staunch Catholic and that I, I made the uh, assumption that it was about Gore's sexuality, his, yeah. his homosexuality. And, and it definitely was not because I was very surprised to learn, like you said, that, that the salon at their house was often um, lots of gay men because that's who Pat, his wife, uh, hung around with. And so I really think it was the uh, th there's there's a there's a couple clues in the film. I, I I think it was Gore's beliefs were antithetical to the survival of the nation. Gore's beliefs were were going to take down the country. I think that and I think that 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 the reason Gore was the one more than anyone else on whom this this real enmity fell was because they were so much alike, born the same year. One was that, you know, Gore was at Exeter, Bill was at Andover. Um, they ran for office. They published their early major works around the same time. Uh, they sounded alike, yeah. you know, this uh, mid-Atlantic patrician accent. And so Sam Tannenhaus, who is Buckley's biographer, um, Said that it says in the movie, each saw in the other his own anxious version of himself. Yeah. In other words, each saw how he feared others might see himself. Buckley was an effete guy, you know. There were rumors about his own sexuality, and and I think he feared that people would believe him to be a person who behaved like and thought like Gore Vidal. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, point. You're listening psychology to, on you. Yeah. <laughs> you're listening to Get It Right with Margaret Hoover on Sirius XM Insight 121. I'm Michael Moynihan filling in for Margaret Hoover, and we have Robert Gordon, the director of the fantastic new documentary about the uh, William F. Buckley Gore Vidal debates in 1968 called Best of Enemies. You know, and it's an interesting uh, point. I'm a great um, uh, digger into old magazines. I have a full run of ramparts and the full run of encounter and I have a lot of old um, national reviews and one thing that I came across which I thought was totally fascinating and I believe it was 1979 or 1980 very early uh, a cover story 
by one of the great radio broadcasters, unfortunately forgotten about now, named David Brudnoy, who is a radio broadcaster in Boston, a talk radio host, and one of the last real intellectuals on the radio. And David Brudnoy um, unfortunately passed away in the mid-90s, uh, complications uh, relating to uh, AIDS. And he had a cover story, and uh, he was a sort of libertarian type conservative. He had a cover story, the case for the, the conservative case for gay rights. And it was on the cover in 19, I believe, 1980 or 1981. And I looked at the next issue, next couple of issues. It's a fortnight, fortnightly magazine. So a few issues later, you have these spittle flecked uh, letters. How dare you, Bill? And the other day, I read something here on the air from, the, um, from a new biography, um, forthcoming biography on Joan Didion that interviewed um, uh, Priscilla Buckley, Bill's sister. He said, you know, Joan Didion wrote for us because Bill just liked language. We knew she wasn't a conservative. He used to have all these people that, that didn't, uh, uh, didn't agree uh, in the pages. And Tom Mallon, by the way, another uh, uh, gay writer, um, fantastic novelist, a fantastic guy, uh, recently wrote in The New Yorker about Bill Buckley and said that uh, he had written a book review for, for National Review in which he praised Gore Vidal. <laughs> that, was al that was allowed to stay in. Which, um, And one of the things, I think that one of the great things about your film is that it, it was, and did you really work hard at this or did it just come out naturally, the balance? Uh, you know, it, you come out that uh, that film and I'm thinking like, okay, this is probably going to be taking one side or the other. I presume it's going to be taking uh, Vidal's side. Um, and I, I didn't get that sense at all. I mean, I, I saw this sort of split down the middle. You saw the warts and all uh, of both of these guys. Was that, was that deliberate? Was that something you worked really hard at saying, make sure that we're not doing a political film? It was very deliberate and not too hard. Um, the fine tuning of it was a little bit, you know, that's where it, we, it required some work. But at, the sense of these two guys having parallel lives, someone in the film describes them. Linda Bridges, uh, Bill's uh, longtime personal assistant, describes them as matter and antimatter. Yeah. And, um, and, and so we knew, we knew from the start, even before we began the interviews, that we didn't want to make a film that chose one side over the other. We wanted, you know, this wasn't about the arguments. It was about how we argue. Let's pull wide and make a broader examination. And um, and then the as we and, and then as we sort of built the structure, this sense of parallel lives. It was like a checkerboard with these debates that run through it as a spine. Yeah. Um, and so it was easy to sort of keep a balance because every time we talked about one and it's not by you, you mentioned warts and all and this is not like a you know tell all of, of any kind um it's just frank and it's yeah. it gives it you know gives praise to both men and and it lets other people cr criticize the thoughts of both men but we did work you know in the end we were very keen on understanding we would test it on audiences of about five or six at a time and very keen on making sure that if they felt it leaned one way or the other, that we could understand where and go in and, and tweak because we didn't, we wanted audiences we, we, that, you know, that would have distracted from the point of, 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 of the film if we chose one side or, or the other. And, and I really got to thank you for your, for your, your, your observation because it makes me feel very good. Yeah, no, it was the, it was the first thing that I thought uh, when when the credits rolled. And, um, and I'll say too, you you said you went in thinking it was going to be oh, absolutely you know, favoring Vidal, and, <laughs> and, and and many uh, liberals have told us they went in thinking it was going to be favoring Buckley. So it's very interesting, <laughs> you know, the, the 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 sort of psychology of uh, partisanship. But, yeah. but what we were trying to say was, you know, let us engage. First of all, let us not dumb down. Because these guys were on national TV, you know, they were given these debates. There, there was five at the Republican convention in Miami Beach and five at the Democratic convention in, in, in Chicago. They were given 15 uninterrupted minutes each um, in, in, you know, on a national platform. And one thing they understood then was this was broadcasting, not narrowcasting. It wasn't Fox News preaching to the choir of the Fox News yeah, audience. Exactly. You know, yeah. they knew they could change minds. Now, you know... There's a lot of – they have a hard time getting past their their hatred of each other. But there is, you know, there is some policy discussion um, <laughs> sprinkled throughout like a – like a spy. Yeah, no, it is. It's the it's the thing that you notice, uh, especially when and I didn't even I didn't know this, and I was uh, thanking you guys for for introducing this to me. This moment where 
in the debate, Bill Buckley uh, hands a letter from Bobby Kennedy to Gore Vidal and says, basically says, see, he insults you and basically calls you a bastard in this letter. And he says, let me see that. And you stop and think, say, aren't they supposed to be talking about the conventions? I mean, they're just attacking each other. And then you notice, I mean, we all have our sort of, you know, built-in biases. Um, I went into this not with so much of a political bias, but just a personal bias against uh, Gore Vidal, because I, I think that um, Hitch did a great uh, piece on him called Vidal Loco, um, and, you know, ex-friends that they were, about right. the crackpot strain in, in, in Gore Vidal's thinking. Um, but, you know, one of the, I, I was listening to, I believe, Fresh Air, and the film reviewer um, was was praising the film, and he said um, he said you know and there's a moment when Vidal, and this is of course the the crescendo moment in the film where he says he calls him a queer and says I'll you know I'll I'll suck you in the mouth and you'll stay plastered, and the reviewer said and you know Buckley took the ad hominem he took the bait and went for the ad hominem and I said good God about three seconds before he called him a crypto Nazi. <laughs> Yeah. That's also some, you know, there's a lot of that. And you, I was thinking about this and the, the, the kind of tenor and timber of the debate now is, I mean, recalling also that, that on the convention floor in Chicago, um, an introduction in which uh, the Gestapo tactics of the Chicago police are denounced. Right. Bu Buckley's being denounced as a Nazi on television. It was still pretty rough and tumble stuff back then, too, wasn't it? It was. Um, there was a few differences, you know. That uh, that brutal ad hominem attack um, is sort of the climax. It occurs in the penultimate debate. So you've and it's at the end of the so it's the end of the ninth debate. You've had this slow fuse that's burned, and audiences built as it yeah. developed. You know, people were interested not in a, not just in the shouting, and because they often didn't shout, they often. Um, engaged each other, uh, you know, parrying with jousts and trying to make fun of of, of the other, but um, engaging in actual dialogue too. And I think that what the networks took away, and, and and the surprise for everyone back then was that ABC tripled its yeah. ratings, and the yeah. networks took away this notion of um, of shouting cells, yeah. and and have sort of since then scientifically engineered it so that there's the most possible shouting between commercials <laughs> that they can get. And, and, and they ignored a couple important things. One was the buildup of the traumatic tension, because that's why people tuned in. They wanted, you know, it was like w watching a boxing match or a yeah. thriller. You know, you, you were on the edge of your seat to see what these guys were going to say to is, is a ter it's a terrific um, uh, thing. One thing that um, the, the, the regret that Buckley had, and of course, I, I have to admit that that I had seen the clip before. I'd seen the entire episode before, and my eyes welled with tears um, watching the uh, Charlie Rose bit where where uh, Bill Buckley says I, that he's tired of living. The yeah. one thing I don't I don't want to let Buckley off the hook on one thing, and this is the final thing because we're just running out of time, is that I read his response uh, to all of this in Esquire. This, yeah. you know, and he admits that you know he did all. So call uh, him a queer in a letter to Jack Parr. So that was yeah. not something he did. He had done it before. Robert Gordon, thank you so much. Everybody watched the the film uh, uh, Best of Enemies. Absolutely terrific. Thank you, um, and uh, I will see you back here sometime. So I think Margaret's back next week.